Okay, let's see here. <laughs> the hat? Sure, is that? An actor, I should know that, but. <laughs> see here. Well, let's see if this is, can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, so good to be here. Um, huh. Sorry, I get emotional seeing all these people drawn to Jesus Christ and the revelation of Christ in you. <clears throat> Union life, not I but Christ, <clears throat> whatever you're going to call it. Um, it's about an inner Jesus and just to see people drawn to this message, to this person, um, it's always a God thing. I can't believe people even, sometimes when I look back on my life with this whole thing, I can't even believe God got me involved with this and became my hope, Christ in me, the hope of glory when I had no hope. So at first I just wanted to start an honor. I wanted to honor, although Sylvia and Scott don't need my honoring, but I wanted to honor them just for their <clears throat> perseverance and keeping this message alive over the years. Think about them that's so great is they really don't want to make it about them. Um, <clears throat> They want to make it about Jesus, and that's the way they've always been. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting in a lot of organized churches today, it's about you and your ministry. And uh, Terry Bennett, I think the prophetic guy, he's quite a terrific man, <clears throat> said uh, uh, that the Lord's about to destroy religious Babylon because we're making it about us and about our ministry and who we are rather than who he is. And um, so they've, Scott and Sylvia have <clears throat> stayed away from that. <clears throat> and I so love them and appreciate them. Um, <clears throat> I was, I had got this whole other thing prepared <clears throat> to share and um, sorry if I'm, my allergies are going nuts, it's always a good sign for me. <laughs> um, and then the Lord just kind of changed and said, no, don't go that direction, go this direction. So the first thing I wanted to say was, um, I felt like the Lord was, had some impressions, words for some of you. And it was interesting that Brett was talking about weakness and the value of it. And because um, I felt like a lot of people here had experienced a lot of struggles lately in different areas, whether personal or with the nation or whatever, which is kind of a no-brainer, right? But, um, but a lot of people here had, had really uh, experienced a lot of weakness in their lives in different areas. And I just wanted to, I felt like the Father wanted to encourage everybody that weakness doesn't disqualify you, it qualifies you. And uh, a lot of times I heard an Irish pastor say uh, that, God, the Holy Spirit, will sometimes come in power to weaken you. He'll, he'll arrange circumstances, you know, very to weaken you so he can release his strength to you and greater power can rest upon you. And so I never thought of it in that term, his power coming to weaken me. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I'm just going to shoot up a quick little prayer. Lord, just thank you so much for all these uh, dear people here that you've drawn to you, Jesus. Thank you. You're so good in uniting all of us in your, in your humanity, in your incarnate being. You've united us to you, Jesus, in your very being. You're the God-man, you, you, divinity united to humanity in one person, and we were woven in to your humanity. The word became flesh in the Greek, which is sarx, fallen flesh. He assumed all of, thank you for assuming all of fallen flesh so you could destroy sin, Satan, 
and death, you died, and you, by, that, by dying, you destroyed death. Thank you so much. So Holy Spirit, just come with your spirit of revelation and wisdom to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves today and reveal yourself to us. You're the self-disclosing God. We won't get a thing unless you disclose yourself to us. So we ask you to do that. As you said to Paul, when Paul, as Paul the apostle said, when God was pleased to reveal his son in me. So do that for all of us in greater ways today in Jesus' name. So... <clears throat> Um, Galatians 2.20, my life-saving verse. Uh, I thought I'd back up because I was just um, thinking about the what would Jesus do wristbands and how I would always tell people, they would say, hey, Bill, what would Jesus do? And I said, I, I'll tell you what he'll, he'll do. He'll do for you what you can't do for yourself. That he's the vicarious God, man, who comes to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And it all started, thankfully, um, this was back in the 70s, you guys, and um, I just run out of gas. I was going to the Vineyard Christian Fellowship, and really good fellowship. The pastor was, was, was fantastic. His name was Ken Gullickson, and he would say things like, Christ is the real you. I thought, what? Christ is the real you in you. And one time he said, Christ is in you as you. I thought, what? What's that? And I kind of liked it because something went off inside me, but I, I, didn't, I didn't understand it at all. And um, so, but anyway, I was in the throes of trying to be the unbelievable believer you know, the incredible Christian, you know, loving everyone, serving everybody, trying to be holy, fasting, not much of that, but, <laughs> but uh, trying to do all that kind of stuff. And I, uh, and I burned out and found out that the Christian life wasn't difficult, it was impossible. <clears throat> and there was only one person who could live it, and that was Jesus Christ, who's the life. <laughs> He's the only life that can live the Christian life by being himself in and through us, right? So um, I decided, having grown up in a dysfunctional alcoholic family, so that pretty much wipes you out. As I always tell people, it, it took me years to get my father's face off of God, God the Father's face. I would see God as this alone God up in the sky disapproving of me. I had no idea that you know, that I, would, I, that I was created in him, in a sense. I'll have to explain that more later. But, um, but looking down, wanting to judge me for each little thing I did. <clears throat> and uh, I had no idea that God was Father. He's actually Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's a triune God, which is very important, by the way. Because most people give lip service to the Trinity, but the reason it's important, which isn't in the Bible, by the way, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all over the Bible together. And God is, so God is relationship. It's a, a mutual interpenetration of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They go in and out of each other. It's, it's a love relationship in the very Godhead itself. So that's why it's so important to realize He's a trinity and once a family of sons and wanted to include all of us into his very being and love, love being with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So I was wearing out, you guys, trying to do all this. It was burning out. So I just decided I was going to slip away and leave the church, not because of Ken, who was a, really a grace guy, but my own stuff I put on myself and other and some other believers really, uh, with a, you know, probably religious spirit telling me I had to do all these things um, to get into God, to get close to God, to, you know, that whole scene. And so um, I was going to split, so I did. <clears throat> and I was just going to, I went away quietly and I walked into a Christian bookstore 
<clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> the last place I wanted to be because I was going to walk away from the Christian life, but not from Jesus, but I didn't know how that, this was all, all going to work. <clears throat> so I walk into the bookstore, and some of you have heard this ad nauseum, so sorry about this, but I just felt like I needed to go back to the basics of what happened when I saw newer folks here, although I think a lot of the newer folks have light on this already. But anyway, so I go into the bookstore, and I look at a book, it says, Not I, But Christ, and the not I, it seemed like the not I popped out at me. What's that? And uh, so I take the book out. It's called Not I But Christ by Watchman Nee. I have another one of his books. I don't know if I'll read from here. The Overcoming Life <clears throat> um, by Watchman Nee. Some dynamite stuff. Um, sorry, you guys. <clears throat> um, so um, I go... I. Open the book to the best chapter in the book, chapter 27. I think it's called Our Life. And Watchman Nee said this. I'd never heard this said by anybody. He said, the great news of the gospel is not only has he delivered you from death, he's delivered you from having to live. Not only did he die for you, but he lives for you. Not only is he your substitute in death, He's your substitute in life. And so he went on throughout the, the book, uh, continuing to say he's delivered you from living. Well, I'd never heard anything like that in my life because I, I thought it was up to me to live the life, maybe with his help, but I, I thought it was up to me to live the Christian life. And so he was saying, no, there's another who lives the life, and it ain't you. And I, you know, I'd never heard anything like that, and it started to give me just a little, a little bit of hope. And so I, I started reading all of his material. Uh, he has a lot of good things. I just remember Christ, the sum of all things, the overcoming life, not I, but Christ. Um, oh, there's just a whole lot of them. Um, the one on Romans 6, I can't remember the name of that, but anyway, uh, it's terrific stuff. And um, so that really encouraged me, and I read the verse, Oh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I thought, oh, I kind of got a little encouraged. By, Are you saying that, Lord, you're somehow in me, and you, you're, you're going to be my hope? And slowly, through all my conditioning for a replacement, because to get this, usually you have to be pretty hammered, you guys. I know you know this, everybody in here probably you've been through a lot of stuff, to be con conditioned for a replacement for another living instead of you, um, you have to be hit pretty hard. And um, because otherwise, you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty, with God's help, and you're the victorious Christian, you're doing, doing great, you're going on with God. And that's kind, kind of how I started out. You know, um, so... The next little thing that occurred to me was Norman Grubb came to town, came to the vineyard where I was, where I was going, and I, I heard he was, uh, this, we had the speaker, someone invited me, and I really didn't want to go. I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll go. And so I'm up there, and Ken's introducing Norman, and so I'm sitting like in the third row, and um, he, he says, oh, Norman, come on up. And so Norman... Uh, came up. Well, you know, he's hunched over, and I usually imitate him. I won't right now, but he's waddling up there. Oh, wonderful. He, and he's, he's, he's waddling up to the, the podium, you know, and I thought, you know, I, I was thinking, I wonder if I could sneak out of here real quick, you know, because I, I, don't, I, I don't think I'm going to be in, in, in to whatever this is going to be. And then, and then Norman said, the bomb, which I didn't even get, but it went off. And he, he said, it's never becoming something. It's containing someone. Self-improvement is the greatest lie in the church today. It sounded pretty good to me, although I, I kind of thought, I think 
I think maybe I'm trying to improve myself. <laughs> but I, I didn't get the full, you know, uh, imp- you know, the, it didn't really hit me that hard, but I, I kind of liked it. And so he, he went on to talk about that, and he talked about, <clears throat> uh, you're just a cup. It's a cup of coffee. You're a cup on a kitchen counter. And he said, what, is the, what, what, what does a cup do on a kitchen counter? What's its main function? And I, I kind of thought to myself, well, takes the coffee and he said it's receptivity it receives the coffee it's not running around by itself on the kitchen counter you know and I I thought well that's true but and I'm still trying to figure this out and he says but unfortunately the coffee represents Jesus and Jesus is the wisdom and the sanctification and the redemption and the holiness all the fruit of the spirit um Everything that you can't be apart from Jesus, he is in and through this cup, trying to be, the cup trying to be like the coffee. You know, all these, so so he was going over all these kind of little nuanced things, and it was just kind of, what? You know, and he, he said, you have to, he said, you're just a donut with a big hole in it. I thought, What? A donut with a big hole in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he said, it, he said oh, it's a, a nothing. It's a nothing thing. It's a nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing in the whole, and everything's in the nothing. And I think, you know, so I, so it was, I, well, that went, don't get that for sure. <laughs> you know, so he threw these things in, you know, uh, I have to tell you about the home group. When he came to my home group, that was just too much, but. Anyway, so um, so he goes on talking about that, and he says, and, and, and yet you're also, the cup coffee thing only goes so far, you're a branch of a living vine. So that's where it shows you a living union. And he said an interesting thing. Of course, I didn't get this. You are the vine in branch form. I thought, what? I'm the vine in branch form? I thought it was the branch. Uh, now I'm the vine in branch form, and so he, he, so I didn't quite get that, and I knew he wasn't saying you're God or you're Christ in some weird thing like this, because I knew even back then that Jesus Christ was the holy other one, and he's the creator, we're the creature, he's the infinite one, we're the finite one, and so there is a or, or we wouldn't have a love relationship, there wouldn't be love, love needs another. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off on that, but, but so, so, he, so he, he started going off on the branch vine thing, and, um, and, he, and I remembered Ken Gullickson, the pastor of the church, he just, all of a sudden one time in the school, I was taking the vineyard school, Ken stood up and said, now here's the, here's the branch, here's the vine, and he says, does the branch do this? <clears throat> Apple. I thought, no. No, it, he said, no, it just abides. It just stays where it is. Uh, abide in me means to remain. Just stay where you are. Recognize where you are. You're already there. He grafted you in. You're already there. And the vine sap just naturally flows through. And, and the fruit pops up on the vine. So... Um, so he went over some of those kind of different illustrations. So that was all somewhat new to me. <laughs> and then he had a meeting for all the pastors, all these vineyard pastors came. And here he is, he was in his, probably in his late 80s or something like that at the time. And um, so they were going to ask him questions and answers. So I love sharing this, even though I've shared it a lot, uh, just, just for, especially for people who haven't heard it, it's just gonna, hopefully will affirm what you already know inside. Uh, but one of the pastors asked him, so Norman, sh- but shouldn't we try to live the Christian life? And he said, oh no, my dear. Trying is Satan. And he, he would always give them a verse, so he gave them the verse and in Romans 7, when I would do, do good, evil is present with me. And, 
Norman went on to say, why did Paul say that? He said, he said it because when you try to do good apart from Jesus, it's really the devil having access to you because only Jesus does the good. You know, so uh, I thought, well, that was interesting. And it, it kind of, you could tell everyone was, oh. and he said, no, no it's, it's trusting in another, my dear. Trusting in another who lives the life you can't live. Even he was the vicarious man who trusted in the life of the Father for us as us that allows us to, to participate in his faith. And he, it's his faith, living by the faithfulness of the faith of, of the Son of God. You guys all know that one. So and then someone asked him, um, so... Uh, uh, I always have to clarify this when I, the next question, because these are pastors really wanting to know things. So one of them said, well, how are you delivered from a repetitive habit sin in your life? I thought, well, this should be an interesting one. So he said, oh, my dear, just tell the Lord. I, as you can tell, I like to imitate him. He's just such a crack up. Oh, oh, my, oh, my dear, just, he'd always say, oh, my dear, oh, my dear, just tell the Lord uh, you're going to do it. Uh, ten times in a row unless he stops you and take no condemnation. I thought, what? Uh, I, I, you know, and, and of course he was talking about habit sins because he was tough on if someone, actually I was in a meeting with him. Norman gets through sharing and the woman across from me, this actually happened, you guys, said to me, it wasn't that wonderful? I said, yeah, it was really, really good. And I was traveling with him at the time a little bit. And she goes, uh, isn't it great that we can, I, I, really, I, she said this, isn't, isn't it great that we can just go to bed with whoever we want to go to bed with? I, was like, I said, oh, no, he was not saying that. She goes, oh, yeah, that's what he's saying. We have freedom. We have freedom in Christ. And so Norman, who, if you knew him, he was passed out in the spirit because he was eating of living bread inside him. So he, the mystics called it the sweet sleep of love. And he just all of a sudden, so he was drinking in the Lord. Some people might call it soaking or, uh, you know, or just listening to a good worship song and receiving. You can do it different ways, but he would really, he got it from the inside out. Adam knew Eve. It's inner penetration. It's an inner union, inner spirit union. And Norman would go into that. And he'd, so he'd be passed out and people would come up to him and say, Oh, Norman, you must be tired. Oh, no, my dear. I'm feeding on living bread. And they'd say, Oh, that's nice for that old man to say that. I, and I'd be there saying, He's actually doing that. And it started making me... I thought, he, he's, he's... No... And um, another one came up to him, and he said, oh, you must be tired. Oh, I live drunk, my dear. I live. And they, oh, that's, and they, you know, of course, Acts talks about being drunk, you know, being not drunk as you suppose. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, so he'd always give these one-liners that would really um, throw people off. And uh, so... That was kind of the beginning of my journey and in, in, in coming into some of this. And so I, I started to, he started focusing on there's no such thing as an independent self where you're a self by yourself a, with a power of your own. You are a self by yourself. You're a unique God created human self that God created, but not with a life of your own. You're distinct, and, but united to him, but you're distinct. And the Father loves you incredibly, uh, how he created you and everything. But you don't have the power in and of yourself, the nature to produce and initiate apart from Jesus. So... Um, So he started focusing on that, and it, was, it started becoming a little bit of a reality in my life. I thought, oh, gosh, because I was 
going from that trying stage, you guys, as you probably heard Sylvia. By the way, Sylvia's book is Dynamite on eagle, Wings with Eagles. I mean, I would get that. It's her life work. It's just incredible. And I think she has another one with all her booklets, but they're all, I would encourage you to pick those up. My goodness. But anyway, um, so where was I? Who knows? Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, I didn't finish that. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Everyone's wondering, what did he say to that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's the two hours sleep. Maybe I'll blame it on that. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, you guys. So, so she, I was saying, no, that's not what he was saying. And then he, he popped out of his sleep. It's, oh, oh, my dear, no, oh, no, no, the, oh, the devil's got you, my dear. My, it's when he, the devil's got you, no, no, you're in sin, my, no, you get off of that, my dear. And then she just turned really red and she stormed, stormed out of the room. So he was, my point was, right, he was difficult on sin. You know, if, if people would come to him, you know, I mean, he was, you know, you know, out and out, I mean, I mean, yeah, if someone's really caught in some, sometimes people are stuck in some kind of those things, and it's going to take a deliverance. The Holy Spirit's going to have to come and deliver them out of it. They're so, so entrenched in it. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so he would give those one-liners, and it would just, um, you know, <laughs> really affect people. You never knew what was going to pop out of his mouth. Yeah, so I, the no, back to the no independent self thing. So um, you're not a self by yourself, a self alone. You know, I'm just me with a life of my own. Well, you are in one sense just you as a distinct, unique, God-created person that God loves, but you, not with a life of your own. You're a dependent self. You're not an independent self. I'm just I like to, sorry, you guys, I like to clarify those things because I, I kind of learned some of those things with Sylvia along the way, and it's like, uh, uh, so uh, that was a real thrill for me. So when I was traveling with Norman for a while, I would always wait for him. I knew the progression he would go through getting to um, the Christ in you as you kind of thing, and I couldn't wait for the no independent self when he got to no independent self. I couldn't wait for that because I, in one sense, had lost myself. What I really lost was a false self, a false identity, a satanic lie is what I lost. But I didn't know that. I, I, I kind of disappeared, and Jesus became very good, which in one sense is a really good thing because all of a sudden, think, oh, you live the life. You're my holiness. You're my sanctification. You know, you're the everything I can't be, and you, you, you're the beer and the doer. And so my focus started going back to Jesus, um, who was the one who could do what I could not do. And the little Bill became the little I, as you see in Sylvia's chart. And so I started wondering about, well, what about unique Bill? You know, when, what hap when do I, because I, I didn't want to get myself back. The thing is, I never went anywhere. <laughs> I was always Bill Bauer, uniquely created and beautiful, and God loved me. So I, I didn't go anywhere, but I, what went someplace was the loss of a false identity, a false satanic identity that I thought I was bad, and I didn't like myself, I didn't like that self, I had this problem, that problem, all that kind of stuff was a false identity, was not the real me, you know, and I, and so I had, I lost that, and so I actually, when uh, the Holy Spirit came with an inner awareness, a revelation of him living as me in God's time and his own way, I really came back and realized I hadn't gone anywhere, that I was beautiful, unique, the way God, and, and united to him, and that in some ways, 
I'd never been separated because even when I was an unbeliever, he was holding me together. He was sustaining me. Not too many times you hear people teach a message on Jesus Christ, the creator and sustainer of all things. I have four scriptures on that here. I was going to read maybe. Well, I probably won't get to it. Anyway, on how he upheld by the word of his power, how he, in him all things consist. He's, he's holding all, but they're deluded and they're stolen by a false father and they're living by a lie, which is very destructive, of course, and they think they're, they're, they're separated in their minds with their sin and so forth, but he hasn't separated himself from them. He's still there trying to reach them, but they're not living by that life. I want to make that clear. They're living by a false lie and a false deity. Um, so I don't know I want to make that clear, but I like the scripture in Acts. In him you live and move and have your being. That was spoken to the pagans and are his offspring. So, I like to say, I'm not so much these days saying us and them, insider, outsider. I like to say they're insiders if, if they knew it. They, they don't know it. They need to receive it and accept Jesus. They need to receive it. Uh, but the work has already been done objectively. The work is already complete. It's already happened. And when you get that sense, you guys, when you realize it's already occurred in the incarnation and the hypostatic union, big words, I'm not a theologian, I'm armchair, I'm probably, yeah, I always tell people theology for dummies, that would be the book I would write. So, but, um, but um, yeah, so when you get that, it destroys all religious, demonic, separate mentalities and all your religious strivings to get back into union. I gotta climb into union. I gotta get close to God. I gotta get into him. I gotta do all these things to get into him. That separation, oh, God's over there. I gotta get into him there, and he's in that building, but he's not here. No, he's all in all, he's everywhere. He may not be manifesting everywhere, but he, he's, he's all in all. And, and so um, it, it completely destroys all religious strive, strivings for obedience, sanctification, faith. Jesus, the vicarious man, the, as came on the man's... As, he came and acted as God, and then he came and acted as man for us vicariously in all these different areas of sanctification, obedience in his very life, right from the virgin, his whole life was a vicarious, um, how would you say it, uh, doing. It was his obedience in his 30 years. It was his repentance. It was his f faith. It was everything he, he did for us, as us, as man. And so our amen is just simply to what he's doing in us and through us. So anyway, I, I kind of got off on a tangent on that, you guys. So it's because I was going to share all that kind of thing. But, but back to Norman. So when Norman got to you're not a self by yourself, self can't change self. Self can't recommit self. Self can't even repent. You know, uh, self can't... Uh, we could probably, if I asked you, you'd give about 50 things that self can't do. So, but that was all so liberating to me because I was all living by the lie of an independent self thinking I had to measure up and thinking I had to earn God's favor and by doing all these religious activities. So, so that, was, that, that was kind of my start in opening all this up with Norman Grubb, you guys. And um, I, I was just trying to think... Uh, one of the other things he said, if I sh should mention that or not, uh, he was just so encouraging. And I, I think the reason I'm going down this trail is I happened to run into a bunch of people today and they said they, they, 
they enjoyed the Norman Grubb impressions or they wanted to know more about Norman Grubb or I think it was, who was it? I think it was um, Joel said he's reading Reese Howell's book and different people were, were, were talking about Norman and wanting to know more about Norman and so um, he, you, got, you get back your humanity. There was n nothing there was nothing any there was never anything wrong with your humanity and we should get that clue because Jesus became a human being actually he assumed fallen flesh sarks so he became human so he showed the value of being human he could have come as a a donkey or he could have come as a or whatever you know but he came as a human being he became a human someone said to me yesterday oh yeah he was god with the skin on i said no no, he became human, and he'll, he'll never again be God apart from humanity. There's a flesh and bone human sitting in the middle of the Trinity. <laughs> and, and we're in that flesh and bone human. We're in his humanity. So he's glorifying, he's glor we're glorif he's glorifying our humanity. Our humanity is being, don't let this scare you, our humanity is being divinized. What does that mean? We're partakers of his divine nature. He's divinized, so we're becoming more human than we were dehumanized under Satan's control. We're, we're not living, we were not human, fully human. But now we're, now we're really getting more human. Sylvia and I always love to talk about, don't we, Sylvia? About we're one with him. This is the one thing I asked Norman, you guys. You know, my first time to ask Norman Grubb a question, what would I ask him? Of all things, I asked him this. And he had this dear woman, Eunice, I remember her name, talking to him. And Norman would just sit there and listen to you and just love on you and listen. And if you ask him, he'll, he'll pop out with something. But, and so Eunice would just go on and on because she had a lot of pain, a lot of stuff going on in her life. So she was going on, but it was going on a long, long time. So it was an hour, hour and a half. I'm waiting to ask my one question. I'm just sitting in a chair next. So finally it ended and Norman popped, uh, do, you, uh, uh, do you have something you want to say, my dear? And I said, yeah, Norman, uh, we're not just one with him in the spirit, are we? She's, oh no, my dear. You're one with him, spirit, soul, and body. And he emphasized the body. And body. And I knew he would give me that exact answer before he said it. And I knew, I knew I was going to experience that in my life. <laughs> that very thing. So, it's great, you know, the Holy Spirit will quicken our mortal body. What in the world does that mean, you know? You know, Sylvie and I kid around, not really kidding around, we'll say, hey, this is his hand. These are his eyes. This is his ear. There's a oneness. We're not saying we're God. He's the holy other one, but we're, there's such a, one is one. It's not two, but in, in the one is always the two because it's a love relationship as well where you can hear from God, receive from God, so you can't blow off I think some people can blow off the relationship. It's a union relationship. Um, yeah, so that thrilled me, you guys. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, and it was interesting uh, because I don't know if all this, maybe it's part of the prophetic or something with me or whatever, but... Um, I've ex I, I'll feel things real easily, you know, on my body. It doesn't make me any more spiritual than anybody else. It's no badge of spirituality, you guys. Sometimes I, when it first started happening, I thought it was crazy. I would, I'd get hit by fire a lot and feel fire in my body. And, and uh, at inappropriate times, like in a restaurant, I'll scream, you know, because it, it hits you so hard. But, uh, but I think just part of it is, is all um, humanity becoming ablaze with God. Do you know we're all burning bushes? That we have a fire that 
won't consume us. It only consumes the bad stuff, sin and the devil. And, but it doesn't consume us like the burning bush was not consumed. So we can live that kind of blazing life. Uh, we are burning bushes, ablaze with God. If we say we are, and we'll probably experience it. Norman would always say, what you take takes you. And I think there was real validity to, to that. You know, because that, 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 you know, when you're going through struggling with your performance, quote, or you're struggling in an area of sin, or you're struggling in... Uh, Whatever, you know, when temptation comes, I didn't mean to get into temptation, although there was something I was going to read here in, the, in this book, but uh, when temptation comes, agree with your adversary quickly, right? And so you say, Satan, you're doing a, you probably know this, you're doing, a, you're, you're doing a very good job, Satan. And when you free a temptation to be a temptation, then you're free to say, hey, but that's not who I am. Lord, you're handling this temptation. You're taking, you're the... You're the love for this feeling of dis hatred I have for this person or uh, peace for this anxiety I'm feeling. So you, you transfer your attention to all those things Jesus Christ, the person, is in and through you. And it takes the sting, the bite out of the temptation. Um, I was just reading, and I won't read it, but Watchman Nee was saying, when temptation comes, don't move. Don't move. Look away from it and, and let the Lord move in on you. That's the way he said it. Let the Lord move into you because he's the victory for you. He's the deliverance for you. And just that when you get hit by on all the all different sides and I actually kind of felt like that when I came here that there were I don't know maybe a few individuals here that have been really getting hit in certain ways or some hurtful things different in different ways have hit you and so it reminded me and I, I got that when I was in California and then I looked and I saw this book the overcoming life and I turned right to this that this section where he talks about um, you know <laughs> And, and it was so funny, as someone had said something to me, I hadn't had anything for at least a little while like this. Usually I get attacked in some way or in the other, but um, someone just said an, out of the blue an unkind thing to me. And I thought, and I was not expecting it, and although it's happened before from this person, and, but not for a long time, and, and it was really bothering me when I got home. And... Uh, and I, so I, all of a sudden, the Lord, Holy Spirit checked me and said, Bill, what are you thinking about going around and around about this and thinking what you're going to go and confront him? And what? What are, you, what are you doing that for? And I said, oh, Lord. And I just kind of became still and said, Lord, thank you. You're handling. You're the, you're, you, you've already achieved. You're the victory in this. I've got this because you, you've got it. You're the victory. You're the, the. And I'm not kidding. And, you know, like three minutes, it was gone. And I... I was often doing something else. Um, but don't move, you know. It's an, ex <laughs> it's an exchange. I was... Brothers and sisters, victory has to do with an exchanged life, not a changed life. Victory does not mean that one is changed, but rather that one is exchanged. We are very familiar, familiar with Galatians 2.20, which says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. You know the verse. What does this verse mean? It means that our life is exchanged. Of course, we know it's uh, an independent lie life of the spirit of error that's been exchanged for the real life of Christ. But our life is no... It means that our life is exchanged. Our life is no longer in the realm of I. It has nothing to do with us anymore. It is not an evil I being changed into a good I or a filthy I being changed into a clean I. It is to be no longer I. The greatest mistake we make today is to think that victory involves progress and that defeat involves the absence of progress. Um, 
That is why we think that everything will be well if we do not lose our temper or if we have intimate fellowship with God. We think that if we have these things, we will overcome, but we have to remember that victory has nothing to do with us. We play no part in the victory. One brother once said to me in tears, I cannot overcome. I answered, brother, indeed, you cannot overcome. He continued, I cannot overcome and there's nothing I can do. I said, God has no intention for you to overcome in yourself. It is not his intention that your evil temper be changed to a good temper or that your stubbornness be changed to meekness. God has no intention to change sorrow to joy. His way is to make an exchange of your life. It has nothing to do with you. It goes on that whole rest of the chapter is the nuclear bomb. Getting you off self. Or religion always tries to throw us back on ourselves and has made a complete industry, made all kinds of money, telling people you're separated from a God, you've got to do all these things to get into God or... Uh, come to church and you're in sin all the time and we're going to give you the remedy which never is which is never given i think even brett said that today but um um yeah so i'm just waiting to see where to go from here i was uh, in my home group and uh, Norman was, I asked him to come to speak at my home group. I had a large home group, like 75 people, me and two others who did the worship. And, and uh, so Norman came and he, he said to me, uh, Bill, uh, 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 what would you like me to speak on? And I, I said, well, just speak on the, you know, the union stuff, just the basics. They don't know anything. Of course, you never know what he's going to say. So he's there and... So he's passed out in the, he says that and then he passes out. So he's waiting there. So I said, okay, Norman, well, uh, I guess uh, we're really looking forward to having you share here. And, and um, so he, he, he just, all of a sudden, he's just, he's just staying there like that. So then finally, he's tapping his one finger <laughs> on the table. I thought, well, that's good. That looks like some life happening. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and then he says this. I mean, I, I could have punched him because I knew I was going to get the flag. He said, he goes, this table is spirit in table form. Uh, uh, and everyone's looking at what? You know, <laughs> I can't even remember how it progressed after that. Finally, he got off of that. You know, but the Holy Spirit isn't the table. <laughs> He's in everything. Um, he was, some people accused him of being a pantheist, and he wasn't that at all. Some people might use the term panentheist, uh, that the Spirit's in everything, which the Bible clearly uh, says. So um, there's nothing outside of God. Jenny, nothing outside of God including the devil, hell, all of creation, heaven. I, I told my friend Nick once, yeah, I, we were talking, I said, yeah, Nick. One day I just, I just popped on me, I said, Nick, heaven's inside of Christ. And I, I just kind of said that, and Nick always reminds me, it, it, it whacked him. <laughs> we said, but, it, but nothing's outside of God. He's, he's not those things, but he's... If I make my bed in hell, you're there. So he, he's, er anyway, so that's, the, but that's a heavy thing. Is that in your wings with evil? It is, isn't it? Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so. Oh, is that what it's called? Explaining the unexplained. Is that the name, name of the chapter? Explaining the unexplainable in Sylvia's book. That would be a good one. I'm going to take a look at that again. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so then he went on to the basics of the union. And, and so uh, I started sharing this with everyone at the church. So one day, Ken Gullickson, who I just love, later Ken, the pastor, came up to me when Norman died and said, Bill, Norman 
affected my life more than any other person in the body of Christ. And now Ken, you know, was kind of celebrity pastor. Bob Dylan got saved in our church. That was Keith Green was in. We, we had a lot of people in our church and um, that were well known. And Ken knew a lot of people. But for him to say that, that was quite something. I just talked to him recently, and he's doing quite well. He's had some real physical challenges. Um, but anyway, Ken came up to me in the church and said, Bill, there's some people that want to ask you a few questions about some of the things you're sharing. Would you mind going come, go in the back room with me? And we'll just... I said, sure. And I had no idea. So I walk in, there's about 30 people in there, and they're all my friends. And um, so they're starting to ask, you know, Ken said, well, what are your objections? And so they would ask me, like, you know, Bill said, you don't have to read the Bible. And I said, well, you search the scriptures that in them you find, you, that you, you search the scriptures that in them you might find life, but they're testifying of me and you wouldn't come to me that you might find life. So, so I would just respond in these different ways about the different things they they would say. So anyway, it was it was quite a time, you know, and, and they're, all, they're all great people. And no one ever said another word because Ken got up with his wife and said after all the questions were, they were asking me questions, and I would just give them kind of these answers, you know. And, uh, and then Ken stood up and said, well, you guys don't have any problem that you're Christ in your human form, do you? And then he turned and walked out the door. I thought, oh my gosh. And... I, 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 and, and one time, this religious, funny, I'm going on this tangent with Norman, but uh, this fellow, kind of a real religious spirited, kind of witch hunter guy, came up to Norman and said, Norman, you're saying you're God. You're saying you're Christ. And he said, no, I, no, I'm not. You, you, you're saying you're saying you're Christ. You said you're Christ in your human form. And Norman said, no. And so he, he's... He turned away, and Norman said, uh, Christ, I said, you're Christ in your human form, in your human form. And by that he meant not that he was Christ. He meant that the, the real life in you, the real person in you is the real life expressing himself out through your unique individual person. And so it was always quite a time, you guys, with Norman, never a dull moment. I have all these Norman stories, as as as, as some of the regulars know here that I've I've shared in the past. But it was um, no, I, I <laughs> well, I'll just I, I just thought of one. I'll just tell this one because it cracks me up. Uh, we were somewhere traveling and and uh, staying at someone's home, and with Norman. Uh, I'd always go ahead of him to the hostess, or usually was, and I'd say, could you, if, if you're going to give him any cookies or coffee, could you, or tea, could you just give it to him? Don't ask him. He'll say no every time. But if you give it to him, he'll love it. So that would always work. It, she, they give, oh, wonderful, my dear. Thank you. But if, if, yeah, do you want some cookies? And, oh, no, I'm fine, my dear. So he'd, he'd always do that kind of, anyway, I was in this home, and uh, this young man came in, frizzy hair all over the place, to be delivered from a demon. And so, uh, you know, the, the person at the house said, you know, um, yeah, Norman, there's a person here who wants to be delivered from a demon. So, um, would, you, would you do, oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. So, I'm, I was in the bedroom and the walls were really thin and Norman was going to be in this little adjacent room so I could hear everything. So this guy comes in and uh, he says to Norman, um, <laughs> and he was really anxiety ridden and Norman, you know, kind of like, I, 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 I'm, I'm possessed, I, I have a demon and could you, could you help me? Could you get rid of the demon? Uh, Norman and Norman, Norman says, uh, Oh, no, he's bluffing you, my dear. He's bluffing you. Uh, no, 
Norman, I, 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 I have a demon. I, I, I have a demon, Norman. I, I really do. I, I, I can't seem to get rid of it. I've had other people pray for me, and, and I, I, I can't get rid of it. I've got a, oh, no, my dear. He's bluffing you. He's bluffing you, my dear. Uh, no, no, and he was getting a little more anxious. And well, no, Norman, I, I have, I think I have a demon. Oh no, my dear, you have Christ in you. You have Christ in you, my dear. Uh, oh, I have Christ. Uh, no, I have a demon in me, Norman. I, I have a demon. Made of, no, no, he's bluffing you, my dear. He's bluffing you. You have Christ in you. And it, oh, uh, and here is exactly what he was. And, oh, I, uh, I, I have Christ in me. I have. You've got it, my dear. You've got it. You have Christ in you. Uh, no, no, I, I think I have a, a demon in me, Norman. I, I think I have a demon. Oh, no, he's bluffing you. You guys, this went on. I can't tell you how long. And I, I always kid people. I see, I think the demon jumped from the guy onto my, through the wall onto my head because I felt like I, if he says that bluffing you thing one more time, I'm going to pull every hair out of my head, you know. And so, so finally I thought I got to take a break. So I went out into the lobby and just, you know, sat in a chair and opened the front door. I was just kind of get a breath of fresh air at that man. And uh, so out comes this guy skipping out of the room. And I said, oh, hey, how's it going, dude? He goes, oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I found out I have Christ in me. I have Christ in me. And he just goes skipping down the lane. And I turned to myself and I said to myself, that guy has a demon for sure. <laughs> so, anyway, that was my Norman demon story. So he was, he was a lot of fun. Um, does anybody have any, any particular questions? Yeah, Rich? I have a request. Oh, yes. Yeah. And the young pastor, I believe he was a youth pastor, had just broken hearted. He knew this wasn't going to work for him. The exchange life, everything Norman said. And he broke down and was honest. And Norman's response to him, mm. he confessed, blew, including you, you shared it, blew everyone out of the water. Could you share that instance with us? Gosh. I don't know if I can even remember the incident. It was, it was, it was, it was, it included when he shared it, it was more than likely uh, a sin, a sexual sin that had this young pastor by the throat. Huh. And he confessed it before yeah. the small group, and it was a small group because you all had met in the pastor's study, so it was intimate, and they were peppering him with questions. And when this came out, Norman's response to him started out with wonderful, my dear. No, he's you, let the, <laughs> you let the Lord know that it's his problem. He better do a better job of keeping you and take no condemnation. Yes, yes. Do you remember that? Well, I, I, I have shared that. So has Sylvia and Brian and, and Brett probably and different, Louis, different people have shared that, that he's, he's keeping us and we are kept people. But, you know, Rich, I don't remember that. Yeah, Rich. But tell the story about when you all were sleeping in the same room. Who that was. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, yeah, we, were, we would have these twin beds several times in, this, in, the, you know, in, the, in the same bedroom. And Norman, he, he, <laughs> he wouldn't want to disturb you sleeping, so he had this little pin flashlight. So he, he'd get up out of bed because, you know, he had trouble walking and he's had to hold on to everything. But he'd, he'd, um, he's, now he's going to go find the pin flashlight. So I'm sleeping, but I'm aware he's up and he's, he's, he's going around and he's bumping into everything looking for the pin. And everything he hits, he, he would always thank everything. He said, oh, oh, thank you, my dear. Oh, 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 yes, thank you, thank you. 
and, and, and he's bumping and clunky, and I'm, I'm a little concerned for him, you know, because he's in the dark and everything, and I want to say, Norman, turn on the light, or I, maybe I should have got out of bed and done it myself. But so he would, anyway, he was just doing that, and um, uh, yeah, and then, then he'd go outside, and his typewriter was right outside the door, and so he'd type with his fingers like this, hundreds of letters worldwide to people. I, I always wait for my little letter in my mailbox, Norman P. Grubb, Percy Grubb. Always wait for that letter to come. And uh, yeah, so he was, because uh, he'd always have such incredible wisdom he would share with you. It was just like, whoa. Um, is it, was, was that what you wanted me to say? Yeah. And, and I'll just tell you this last one. I was, I was taking to in, in Simi Valley in California, <laughs> and uh, we're, he's about to speak, he's passed out, and the place is packed out with people. And so I'm standing against the wall because there wasn't a place to sit, and there's a guy next to me in a suit. He looks like some businessman that came, and he's holding all his... his his briefcase and a, a bunch of stuff he had in his arm. And, uh, and Norman was, you know, there were people are waiting for him to speak, you know, and so finally this dog started barking. And so, uh, and so it got Norman's attention a little bit, you know. And uh, so, <laughs> so Nor Norman started to speak, but he was a little irritated that, that, day because the dog was barking he didn't uh, uh, and so he starts speaking slowly and you know he can really if you're if the Lord's not on you he can put people to sleep so the guy next to me starts snoring he's standing up and he's snoring and so so I thought this and I'm thinking everyone's kind of looking he's snoring and then he'd do a big snort you know, so he's snoring, going, and then, and then Norman, Norman, uh, uh, dog, uh, uh, Norman, he's trying to figure out where is it, and so he just, and so and then I go back and I kind of chill out again and everything, and then, and then he quiet down, then he starts snoring again, snoring again, and, and, and then finally, you guys, he just literally, uh, and the brief, everything goes flying, he hits the ground. He went to his knee, and all the books went flying. What? Maybe closed. We need to go close the meeting. He would get irritated at little things that would happen like that. So, yeah, those were those were the those were the good days. But you guys, the revelation of Christ in you as you is, and the as you is 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 the oneness. It's Christ as if it was you, but it's you as you. So it's distinct, oneness with distinction. You don't lose your unique personality and who God's made and created you to be. Anyway, maybe I...